So let's begin chapter 48, the nervous system. Every time you move a muscle and every time you think a thought, your nerve cells are hard at work. They are processing information, receiving signals, deciding what to do with them, and dispatching new messages off to their neighbors. Some nerve cells communicate directly with muscle cells, sending them to signals to contract. Other nerve cells are involved solely in communicating only with other nerve cells. And this processing of information must be fast in order to keep up with the ever-changing demands of life. So why do animals need a nervous system? If you think about this bunny, it lives in the wild and there are other animals that want to eat it, such as a lynx or other animals that rely on this bunny for nutrition. So these, this animal has to survive and reproduce if it doesn't want to go extinct. As a result, there has been a selection for a system of neurons for the animal to detect and respond to the environment and to danger. So let's talk about the parts of the nervous system. The basic unit of structure and function of the nervous system is the cell called the neuron. Neurons transmit electrical impulses in the form of diffusion of charged particles throughout the entire cell, which is what we are going to talk about. Now, you can kind of think about this as a wire in a way. The brain is wired to the muscles via these neurons, and if you break these neuron wires, let's call them for now, then you will lose that connection from the brain to the part that it is connected to. So that's why it is a big deal when someone gets a spinal cord injury. In this type of injury, the connection between the brain and the arms or the legs is broken and you cannot send a signal to move those parts and you end up a paraplegic and can only move two arms or a quadriplegic and can not move any part of your body. Now the direction of the signal starts at the dendrites in the neurons. Dendrites are the receiving parts of the neurons, and there can be many. The neuron receives a signal from another part, from another neuron, or for something else that will trigger the neuron, and then it transmits the impulse down the cell body to the axon or the location where the signal leaves the cell. Now it's important to notice that there is only one axon, however there are many dendrites. So the signal will travel down the axon and eventually reach an area called the synapsis. A synapsis is a gap between two different neurons or a gap between a neuron and a muscle cell or something else that is going to be activated. And to bridge the gap, we need something called neurotransmitters, which we are going to go over later. So this is an overview of the neuron's function, is that there are many entry points or many dendrites. There is only one pathway out of the neuron called the axon, and the neuron transmits a signal starting at the dendrites. It goes to the cell body and then to the axon and then to the synapsis that will transmit the signal to another neuron or to what needs to be affected. It is important to know that most of the neuron's organelles, including its nucleus, are located in the cell body. Also, the axon joins the cell body at a location called the axon hillcock. At the axon hillcock, is where the signal is generated in order to be sent down the axon to the synapsis. Now neurons are the most specialized cells in animals. If you consider the brain, which is responsible for thinking, it is a very important part of many living animals. Now the longest neuron in the world is found in the blue well, which is between 10 and 30 meters and it is found in the spinal cord connecting its brain to the very back of the body towards its back fin. The giraffe axon is five meters long and travels down the length of its neck and the human neuron is one to two meters long and is found down the spinal cord
that connects the brain with the rest of the body. Now the nervous system allows for one millisecond of response time which is extremely fast. So how is the signal transmitted down the neuron? We are going to use dominoes as an analogy. So think about how to knock down dominoes. You first start the signal by knocking down the first one, which is like triggering the signal in a neuron. We are then going to propagate or send the signal down the neuron. So if you think about dominoes, the first domino doesn't move, it stays in the same place after it falls over. However, it is the next domino that will hit the next one, that will hit the next one, and even though those dominoes are not moving very far, it does send a wave down the line of them. And that is what we are talking about in neurons, which we will see when the sodium channels open up. So dominoes move down a line, not, it is just a wave through them. Now, then you have to reset the system. Before you can start again, you have to set up the dominoes again, which is like resetting the axon and getting ready to fire another impulse down the neuron, which has to be very quickly. So again, the three steps of nerve transmission are the start of the signal, the propagation or the sending of the signal down the line, and then the resetting of the signal. So let's talk about the transmission of the nerve signal. Neurons have similar systems. There are protein channels set up in the axons and dendrites of the neurons. And these channels are going to be like the dominoes and trigger the next channel to open up so the transmission of the signal can go down the line. Now once the first channel is open, the rest will open in succession. It is an all or nothing response. Once you start the signal, you don't stop it midway, which is important to know. You cannot stop it midway. It is an all or nothing response to the stimulation. Once the impulse starts traveling down the neuron, you cannot stop it. Now, a wave action travels along the neuron and you have to wet, reset the channels so the neuron can react again. This is kind of like dominoes. Once the first one is knocked down, you have to stop and reset it in order to send the signal again. So let's talk about the neurons and their environments. Nerve cells live in a sea of charged ions. We have anions, which are negative ions, and we have cations, which are positive ions. A trick to remember this is anions has one more N than cations, so the extra N is for the negative charge, while the cations have a T and the anions does not have a T, so the T represents a plus symbol for the positive cations. So anions or the negative ions are more concentrated within the cell. There are chlorine ions which are negative and then there are also negatively charged amino acids as well. So again inside the neuron it is more negative and this is starting off. It is not always this way. It won't stay this way. This is at resting potential. So now the cations or the positive ions are going to be more concentrated in the extracellular fluid. And the cations that we are going to talk about is the sodium and potassium ions. This is the reason that you need salt in your diet because you use the sodium chloride for the transmission of nerve impulses. So the nerve cells have voltage. The opposite sides of the cell membrane have a charge built up across it, which is the electrical part that we are talking about when we say that nerve cells send electrical impulses. The membrane is polarized or it has a positive and negative part. So there is a negative inside and a positive outside. 
there is a charge gradient or a difference in the charges and this is like stored energy. It is kind of like when there is osmosis. You go from a high to low water potential, but we're not we, but here we are dealing with charges and it is a little bit different which but we are talking about going from one place to the next place because of differences. Now, this is an imbalance con condition. The positive charged ions repel each other as do the negatively ch charged ions. So they want to flow down their electrical gradient and mix together evenly. This means that there is energy stored here. It is like a dammed up river where the water wants to flow but it cannot. So voltage is the measurement of how much stored electrical energy there is. So let's talk about measuring cell voltage. They have done many experiments to figure out what the cell voltage is, especially on squids axons, which are very thick and make them easy to put probes on. Voltage is again the measure of difference in the concentration of charges. Remember that in a neuron, it has more negative inside. So the charge for an unstimulated neuron or neuron that is at resting potential is negative 70 millivolts. You will need to know this. So once again, an unstimulated neuron not actively transmitting a signal has a resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. It is more negative within the cell. So how does the nerve impulse travel? The nerve is stimulated so we are going to open up the sodium channels in the cell membrane which are protein channels. Once we reach a threshold potential we are going to trigger that all or nothing response. The membrane will then become permeable to the sodium. So the sodium channels in the cell membrane open and the ion diffuses into the cell from a high to low concentration. As the sodium ions diffuse into the cell, it causes the next sodium ion channel to become more permeable and to have a shape change and open to allow sodium into the cell, which is how we are going to be conducting our nerve impulse. So the stimulus is the result of sodium channels opening and the sodium diffusing into the cell, which will then change the charge of the neuron as we conduct the impulse since sodium is a positive charge ion. So how does nerve impulse travel? They travel via a wave, which is how n nerve impulses travel down neurons. Nerve impulses are just the opening of sodium channels as they trigger the next one and send the message down the line. Change in the charge opens the next sodium channel down the line and this is called a voltage gated channel. Volted, voltage gated channels are channels that open in response to a voltage and then the next ones are open because it is a voltage gated channel also. This allows the sodium to diffuse in the ones that are open. Now, this wave moves down the neuron and is called a nerve impulse and or is also called an action potential. So the nerve impulse is called an action potential as it moves down the line. Now the next thing is to reset the nerve which is done by getting rid of the charges. However, we are not going to pump out the sodium that was pumped in. We are going to pump out potassium that is inside the cell. Potassium has a positive charge, so getting rid of some of the positive charge gets rid of some of the positive gained by the nerve impulse or action potential created when the impulse was triggered. So we are resetting the charge, however we are not resetting the sodium yet, which is important to know. So re resetting the second wave travels down the nerve and the 
potassium channels open, the potassium ions will diffuse out of the cell. Now the potassium ion, ion channels open very slowly relative to the sodium channels. This will cause the charge to reverse back to the point where there is more negative inside and more positive outside. However, the sodium has not been reset yet. The wave of opening ion channels moves down ions and signal moves in one direction only, which is the flow of potassium out of the cell which then stops the activation of sodium channels in the wrong direction, which then prevents a reversal of the nerve impulse back from the synapses to the dendrites. Remember, we want to go to the dendrites, to the axons, to the synapses. So as the action potential is propagating or moving down the line, we have a wave or what we call a nerve impulse or action potential which happens in a millisecond. So the potassium and sodium channels are voltage gated channels and these ion channels open and close in response to changes in charge across the membrane. The sodium channels open quickly in response to the depolarization or the change in charges and close slowly. However, the potassium channels open slowly in response to the change in charges and also close slowly. So how does the sodium potassium pump work? It is active transport, which means it needs ATP. It is a protein located in the membrane. Three sodium ions are pumped out and two potassium ions are pumped into the cell. This is a classic example of an active transport and the sodium potassium pump is something you must know. The sodium potassium pumps are one of the main drains on the ATP production in your body which means that you need a lot of sugar or glucose to run it, which means your brain is a very expensive organ to run. So this diagram here shows us how the potassium, sodium potassium pump is working. If you look at the left side right here, it shows you what's happening during the nerve impulse. During the nerve impulse, we're gonna have our sodium channels opening up which allows the diffusion of sodium into the cell. At that same time, after the impulse has traveled through, the potassium channels are gonna open up and diffuse the potassium out to reset the charge gradient. After that, then the sodium potassium pump will work to reset the sodium potassium concentration. At that time, three sodium will be transferred for two potassiums using ATP to run this pump. So then the neuron is ready to fire again when the resting potential is back to negative 70 millivolts. And then we are ready to send another impulse down to our legs, to other neurons, in order for us to run, write, or do whatever we need. Now this is a graph of all the things we just talked about. If we look at the graph, it's divided into six different parts. At the first part down here, we have the resting potential, which is negative 70 millivolts, okay? Then it reaches a threshold potential, which means that we are getting more sodium into the cell that will eventually trigger the activation potential. So then the sodium channels will open and the potassium channels close. As we add more and more sodium, the charge increases. As you can see, the charge is increasing, which will cause the depolarization of the cell. Remember that depolarization is when the cell is equal inside 
and outside. So at this point where we have an equal charge, we're going to have the cell depolarized. And that happens when we allow more sodium or positive charges into the negative charged cell. The sodium channels will then close and the potassium channels will then open more slowly, which will then cause the charge to decrease inside the cell as the positive potassium ions leave and the repolarization will happen as the potassium flow out. Then there will be an undershoot down here, which is when you get a more negative than negative 70 millivolts, which then will be restored instantly. Now around the outside of the axon, we have an insulated sheath called a myelon sheath made up of Schwann cells. It insulates the axon and results in something called salivary conduction. Salivary conduction increases the speed of the nerve impulse as the signal hops from node to node. We are still going to have potassium and sodium channels opening. However, the impulse is going to jump over the Schwann cells and be conducted even faster. Now we are talking about 330 miles per hour versus 11 miles per hour without the myelon sheath. Now here is a figure of the myelon sheath and the Schwann cells. As you can see, the Schwann cells look like fruit roll-ups covering the axons and the nerve impulse is going to jump from node to node. Now these nodes are called R node of Ranmere. Okay, it's important to know this name, node of Ranmere, and the impulse is gonna jump from this node to node to node over these Schwann cells to increase the speed of the impulse. Now, in diseases like multiple sclerosis, um, the immune system, specifically the T-cells, attack the myelon sheath, which caused the transmission of the nerve impulses to be slowed or the loss of the signal between the brain and the body. So what happens at the end of an axon? In most cases, we need to go to a new neuron. And there is a gap between the neurons called a synapsis, and the impulse has to jump the synapsis. Now, a synapsis is a junction between the neurons, so it is the axons of the sending neuron and the dendrites of the receiving neuron, and the impulse has to jump quickly from cell to cell to cell. So let's talk about the events that occur at the synapsis. They involve what we call neurotransmitters which are chemicals that transmit signals across synapses. The first step in this event is that an action potential depolarizes the membrane, which occurs when the sodium or the positive ion moves into the cell, creating equal parts or depolarization of the membrane. The nerve impulse will then trigger at the end of the axon the calcium channels to open, which will then cause the calcium ions to trigger the release of the neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters are in vesicles that will fuse with the axon membrane and will be released by exocytus across the so small synapsis and then will diffuse to the next neuron. The neurons will diffuse across the membrane and bind with a protein receptor and cause a shape change in the next neuron which causes the ion gated channels to open and allow sodium to enter that next ion. The neurotransmitters that will then be degraded or reabsorbed if not used. The neurotransmitters trigger nerve impulses in the next nerve cell, which is called the postsynaptic neuron. The chemical signals causes ion gated channels to open so that sodium can diffuse into the cell and then 
potassium channels will open and diffuse out of the cell like before. So then when we have enough sodium diffused in the cell, a nerve impulse can be sent down the line. Nerves communicate with one another and with muscle cells by using neurotransmitters. These are small molecules that are released from nerve cells and rapidly diffuse into neighboring cells, stimulating a response once they arrive. Many different neurotransmitters are used for different jobs and these are the most important ones that you will need to know. Dopamine and serotonin are evolved in subtle messages of thought and cognition. They are widespread in the brain and they affect sleep, mood, attention, and learning. Now lack of dopamine in the brain is associated with Parkinson's disease, while excess dopamine in the brain is linked with schizophrenia. Epinephrine and norepinephrine is linked with our fight and flight response. Now, the main job of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is to carry the signal from the nerve cell to the muscle cells. When a motor cell nerve cell gets the proper signal from the nervous system, it releases acetylcholine into its synapses. with the muscle cells. There the acetylcholine opens the receptors of the muscle cells triggering the process of contraction. Of course once the message is passed the neurotransmitter must be destroyed otherwise the later signals would get messed up in the jumble of obsolete neurotransmitter molecules. This cleanup of old acetylcholine is the job of an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, which we will talk about later. Now, neurotransmitters are the weak point of the nervous system because they have to cross a gap and things that affect the gap will affect the nervous system and the neurotransmitters. So any substance that affects the neurotransmitters or mim mimics them Effect, affects the nerve function and this includes gases such as nitrous oxide or carbon minoxide or other mind altering drugs such as stimulants such as caffeine and nicotine and they're associated with different drugs and different poisons. So let's talk about acetylcholesterase which is the enzyme that is responsible for breaking down the acetylcholine neurotransmitter that is released into the muscle cell synapsis. Now, since acetylcholine esterase has an essential function, it is a potential weak point in our nervous system. Poisons and toxins that attack the enzyme cause acetylcholine to accumulate in the nerve synapsis, paralyzing the muscle. Over the years, Acetylcholine esterase has been attacked in many ways by natural enemies. For instance, some snake toxins attack acetylcholine esterase and block the active site. The acetylcholine esterase is found in the synapsis between the nerve cell and the muscle cell. It waits patiently and springs into action soon as it as the signal is passed, breaking down the acetylcholine into its two components, acetyl acid and chlorine. This effectively stops the signal, allowing the pieces to be recycled and rebuilt into a new neurotransmitter for the next message. Acetylcholine esterase is one of the fastest reaction rates of any one of our enzymes breaking up each molecule in 80 microseconds. Is the acetylcholine esterase toxin then is a competitive inhibitor and blocks the active site of the acetylcholine esterase so it cannot break down acetylcholine. So remember that competitive inhibitors directly block the active site of enzymes 
while non-competitive inhibitors bind to another location other than the active site on the enzyme to stop it from functioning. So again, an acetylcholine esterase toxin then acts as a competitive inhibitor and blocks the active site of the acetylcholine esterase so it cannot break down acetylcholine. So here are a couple last questions that we should go over that may be lingering. So why are axons so long? It's because they can be used to transmit signals quick, quickly. Remember that the synapsis is the choking point, so reducing the number of synapses can reduce the time for transmission. So why then do we have synapses at all? Because these are the decision points. The inner, they are the intersection of multiple neurons and they are the control points. Okay. Now, how do mind-altering drugs work? They affect the neurotransmitters, release, uptake, or breakdown. Okay, and they block with or react with the receptors and also serve as neurotransmitter mimics. Now, do plants have a nervous system? Do they need a nervous system? They react to stimulus. Is that a nervous system? It depends on what your definition of a nervous system is. But if you can't move quickly, there is little adaptation advantage of a nervous system running at the speed of electrical transmission. So that is the reason for plants.